Hello, friends and neighbors. War Games is the greatest movie of all time, and anyone who says differently, with near 100% certainty, is Johnny Lee Miller. I was zero cool. The cultural impact of War Games is undeniable. After Ronald Reagan saw it on opening weekend in 1983, he freaked out and issued a national security directive on cybercrime. Weird Science, released two years later, is almost a parody of War Games. Two upper-middle-class teenagers use their home computer to break into a powerful military computer. But instead of World War III, Gary and Wyatt use theirs to create Steven Seagal's future third ex-wife. So, what would you little maniacs like to do first? When the first hacker conference was founded in 1993, it was branded DEFCON, in deference to the film's plot device. In 1999, notorious hacker Kevin Mitnick spent eight months in solitary confinement because a prosecutor convinced a judge he could dial into NORAD and launch nuclear missiles. Motherfucker! In the decade or so after the film's release, the common tactic of scanning for computers by dialing large blocks of sequential phone numbers came to be known as war dialing. Isn't that expensive? There's ways around that. Today, the practice of driving around a neighborhood looking for open Wi-Fi networks, war dialing's modern equivalent, is called war driving. Hey, how about a war drive? Huh? We love that. And in 2014's Edge of Tomorrow, released 31 years later and set in the future, the Crystal Palace set from War Games is convincingly used as a background plate. We fight. That's what we do. Okay, so basically what I want to do is talk for three hours about how much I love this movie and how every frame of it is perfect and good in every way. I mean, right out of the gate, the first scene is an astounding short melodrama unto itself. Sir, we are at launch. Turn your key. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Turn your key, sir. Easily one of the greatest opening scenes in all of cinema, just barely nudged out of the top spot by inglorious bastards. Monsieur Lapadite. And Johnny English. Everything in order, English. I think you'll find it's rather more than just in order, sir. You're now entering the most secure location in the whole of England. But I've tried to put together something a little more engaging than, oh my god, I love the scene, watch how cool it is that Lightman gets distracted by the computers even while McKittrick is lecturing him about how he almost started World War III. So good. <clears throat> Let's start with some context. In 1983, War Games was a first. Movies had been made about computers, of course, but nothing with hacking as a central plot device. Tron came out in 1982, but while it is computer-themed, it's not about computers in any real sense, it's about light cycles and gladiators. And the less said about 1969's The Computer Wore Tennis Shoes, starring a 17-year-old Kurt Russell, the better. That doesn't make any sense. There are only two movies I know of prior to 1983 that make any reasonable claim of being about computers while also grounded in some sort of contemporary reality. Desk set from 1957. Here are the rest of Bartlett's quotations. Thank you. Ooh, everything's so dusty back there. One thing we don't like, don't like at all, is a speck of dust. Do we, Michelle? <laughs> and Colossus, the Forbin Project from 1970. Just the few hours that we have spent studying the Colossus printout, we have found a new statement in gravitation and a confirmation of the Eddington theory of the expanding universe. It seems as if science is advancing hundreds of years within a matter of seconds. Starring Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, Desk Set is really a rom-com, and its depiction of the state of computing in 1957 is, let's just say, optimistic. How much damage is done annually to American forests by the spruce bud worm? 138 million four hundred and sixty four thousand three hundred and fifty nine dollars and twelve cents alexa how much damage is done annually to american forests by the spruce bud worm the fuck is the spruce bud worm but it does make an honest attempt at using a computer as a main character in a realistic contemporary setting in a lot of ways i think it's really a spiritual prequel to war games both movies feature a supercomputer whose natural language abilities are way ahead of its time and which threatens the end of the world. 
In war games, it's a literal end of the world by a nuclear decimation, and in desk set, it's more figurative, with the computer threatening to make all of the humans obsolete. The whole darn building's been fired! They took our jobs! Colossus the Forbin Project, like War Games, is a movie about a supercomputer given the authority to start a nuclear war. But that's where the similarities end. It is quite simply terrifying, and I think that if anything, it's more relevant today than it was when it was made. I definitely recommend it. This is the voice of Colossus, the voice of Guardian. We are one. This is the voice of unity. The truly amazing thing is that it happened by accident. The filmmakers thought they were making a movie about nuclear war. The whole plot of David Lightman even owning a computer wasn't in the first draft. He was originally just a really smart kid, and Professor Falcon was going to be an astrophysicist. In fact, Falcon was modeled after Stephen Hawking, whom they actually asked to play the role. Hawking declined because he suspected they were more interested in his disability than his ability. He was apparently right because they then considered having an actor play Falcon in a wheelchair, which they decided against in part because they were afraid that putting a guy in a wheelchair in a war room would invite comparisons to Dr. Strangelove. And again, they thought they were making a movie about nuclear war. They even included a subtle homage to Dr. Strangelove. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. You're not supposed to be running in here. Somebody can get hurt. All of this is according to the director and screenwriters themselves in their 1998 DVD commentary. What they don't mention, though, is the interesting coincidence that they started out wanting Stephen Hawking to play a role in their film, and they ended up with a computer that sounds an awful lot like Hawking's speech synthesizer. My name is Stephen Hawking. Greetings, Professor Falcon. Now, of course, it is also about nuclear war. But when you think about war games, you think about Joshua, not General Berenger. War Games is about nuclear war the same way a mid-90s Jackie Chan movie is about a guy who doesn't want trouble. Oh! Yes, I'm coming! It's definitely part of it, but that's not what you paid to see. You are all garbage! Let's talk about David's computer. Even for a rich kid like him, having a state-of-the-art computer in his bedroom to essentially use as a toy in 1983 is a bit out of reach. So they gave David an MSI 8080. The MSI 8080 is widely regarded as the world's first microcomputer clone. Released in 1975, a few months after the Altair 8800, the MSI 8080 used the same S100 bus architecture as the popular Altair, making it compatible with the same expansion cards. It sported a 2 MHz Intel 8080 processor and up to 8 kilobytes of RAM. The MSI 8080 cost $931 when it was brand new in 1975. Adjusted for inflation, that's roughly $4,500 today. Now that's not cheap, but that's a nice house. And David appears to be an only child. What's more, the MSI 8080 optionally came as a kit, which you would assemble yourself, and that kit only cost $599, which would be $2,800 today. A $3,000 educational toy in that neighborhood doesn't seem entirely unlikely to me. But David also has the optional keyboard, printer, dual 8-inch floppy drive, modem, speaker, and a TRS-80 monitor. Adjusted for inflation, that floppy drive alone retailed for about ten grand in 1975. So if we assume that upwards of $20,000 of computer gear wasn't under the Christmas tree for 9-year-old David, what's going on here? Well, War Games is set in 1983. So eight years after all this gear was new. There was a robust trade in computers like this for years, meaning they held their value pretty well. Until 1981, when the first IBM PC came out. That machine was a game changer, and after it came out, it was all anybody wanted. So machines like the MSI 8080 were suddenly and irrevocably dinosaurs, and the prices fell through the floor. So basically, David could have picked this thing up at his local homebrew club in 1982 with his allowance money. Anyway, the point is, they did their homework. They didn't just tell the prop department to put a screen and a keyboard in his bedroom. They did the creative exercise and the necessary research to figure out how a teenager in 1983 could have a computer in his bedroom at all. And then, didn't bother to explain any of that backstory to the audience, because what do you know about computers anyway, you early 1980s tab-drinking ignoramus? Side note. The Coca-Cola company chose the name Tab for their new soft drink in 1963 by programming an IBM 1401 computer to generate a list of four-letter words with only one vowel. 
From an initial list of 300,000 names that took an entire day to print, they selected tab, which they then truncated to tab. To put that into perspective, the phone in your pocket today can generate 1.6 gigaflops worth of soft drink names twice as long in half the time. Speaking of the Matthew Broderick Ali Sheedy bedroom scene, not trying to put ideas into your head, but if you're into it, my email is Ali Sheedy shipping at no it isn't.com. So they had a credible computer in a teenager's bedroom, but then they had to make it work. In order to give Broderick and Sheedy maximum freedom to focus on acting without having to worry about what was on the screen, they had custom software written that would print the correct words to the screen in response to Broderick's typing, but regardless of what keys he pressed. You can see a mistake that betrays this technique when Joshua prints the list of games and answers his own question before David enters the answer a moment later. Which side do you want? I'll be the Russians. <laughs> This, by the way, is the scene that introduces us to Joshua's voice. Shall we play a game? In order to subconsciously reinforce the idea that Joshua is Falcon's surrogate child, Joshua's voice was created by having John Wood, aka Professor Falcon, Joshua's trying to find the right code so he can launch the missiles himself. Read the lines backwards. Game a play we shall. And then running it through the 1970s robot voice Pro Tools filter. No, 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 no. You have to boost the gain and then turn on modulation. His instructions were quite specific. There it is. <laughs> Established in 1957, the North American Air Defense Command is a joint force between the U.S. and Canada tasked with monitoring the North American airspace for incoming attacks. As the command center in a hypothetical nuclear war, NORAD needed a home that could withstand a nuclear attack. And so construction on the Cheyenne Mountain Complex began in 1961 and was completed in 1967 at an inflation-adjusted cost of roughly a billion dollars. Located in Colorado Springs underneath a freaking mountain, it houses 15 multi-story buildings that are situated on top of giant springs, which would dampen any seismic vibrations resulting from a nearby blast. It contains its own reservoirs of drinking water and gasoline, and is guarded by 25-ton blast doors which open outward, so that the pressure from an unexpected nuclear blast would only push them shut. In 1972, work began to computerize operations at NORAD, and in 1979, that work was completed. It wasn't long before November 3, 1979, when National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski was woken at 3 a.m. by a phone call from NORAD, telling him that the computer screens indicated the Soviets had launched 200 nuclear missiles our way. Crews were sent to their bombers and fighter jets were launched. Minutes later, a second call updated the number to 2,200 nuclear missiles inbound to the U.S. Brzezinski made a silent decision not to wake his wife, but rather to let her die peacefully in her sleep. Then, as he was about to call President Carter to advise an all-out retaliatory strike, he received a third phone call, telling him that in fact, the whole thing had been a training simulation that was mistakenly transferred to the big screens. But hey, enough of that. Let's get back to this silly Hollywood fantasy. As amazing as the Cheyenne Mountain Complex is, one thing it doesn't have is an enormous party room filled with giant computer screens. To that end, War Games director John Badham humbly referred to his movie as NORAD's wet dream of itself. To accomplish this anthropomorphized nocturnal emission, MGM built the Crystal Palace set, the most expensive set it had ever built. It required 12 projectors and 120 video monitors all running in perfect sync with as many as three 24 frame per second cameras. And you will notice there is not a scan line in the place. Because of space limitations, some of the screens were front and some were rear projected. The five screens across the top were front projected from the back of the room, and the seven on the bottom row were rear projected, sometimes in creative ways. For example, the cinemascope projection in the bottom middle was bounced off of two mirrors before reaching the screen. 
With all those projectors running, they had to upgrade the air conditioning and install an exhaust system in order to deal with all of the heat and even the smoke from the projector arc lights. All of the projections were pre-rendered CGI sequences created by a $120,000 HP workstation and then printed to film. Oh, and also, the actors had to, you know, act while all this was going on. Anytime somebody messed up a line, 12 projectors had to be stopped and reset to their starting points. No pressure, you two kids who are both on your second movie ever. Okay, now it's time for the NORAD trivia speed round because I want to hurry up and get to the mistakes. The tunnel entrance to NORAD is also the tunnel to Hill Valley and Toontown. This Jeep crash was an actual onset accident. Those giant Armageddon springs made it into the set design. The Whopper is just an empty box, except for the Apple II sitting inside of it running the LCD screen. And when Air Marshal Carlin here pranks the tourists, he uses a sound effect from Galaga, David's favorite video game. <laughs> That's a joke, you didn't blow up anything. <laughs> Look what you did there. <laughs> Speaking of Galaga, Batam had a Galaga arcade machine delivered to Matthew Broderick's apartment months before shooting even started so he could realistically perform this scene. This scene right here, where he moves a stick in one dimension and mashes a single button for 10 seconds. Oh, and the way David escapes NORAD by recording the door code and playing it back, that's a red box technique. That's what phone freaks did in the 80s to get free calls on pay phones. You know what? I'll just let Razor and Blade explain it. As you can see, this is just a simple micro cassette recorder. Hook it up to the phone and drop in five bucks and quarters. Record the tone that the coins make, and hang up and get your money back. Even a perfect movie isn't perfect. The very first time we see the launch code, it's wrong. That first J should be a C. Maybe it's just a different code, I hear you say. Also, I didn't enjoy one of the videos you made, therefore you should kill yourself. Slow down, YouTube commenter. The odds of any individual code occurring are 1 in 3.6 times 10 to the 15th. That is the approximate number of stars in 10,000 Milky Way galaxies. And the odds of any two codes occurring back to back with only one character different between them are... Yeah, I don't know anything about probability. I just know it's probably not going to happen. After David escapes NORAD and he and Jennifer are on their way to find Professor Falcon, to add some comic relief at the junction of two dramatic scenes, she asks, David, is this because of what you did with my grade? Now, that's a great joke. I laugh every time. The problem is, in order for the joke to make sense, it has to be delivered by an airhead. That's the joke. Airhead misunderstands obvious thing. What was that? <laughs> but Jennifer is not an airhead, and she clearly understands what's going on. She knows they nearly started World War III. Are you watching the news? Yeah, I'm watching. David, it's not us on TV, can we do that? She most certainly does not think this all might be about her biology grade. There's another similar moment toward the end of the film. Just after they reestablish communication with the Whopper, the first thing Dr. McKittrick says is... Order to disarm the missiles. Which is hilarious. And Matthew Broderick's reaction is even funnier. Order to disarm the missiles. No, no. It is such a classic archetypal moment of the older generation not understanding technology and the younger generation having to pick up the slack. The only problem is, Dr. McKittrick built the fucking thing. I think he has a better grasp of how his own invention works than your grandfather does of his iPhone. And finally, when they shot the biology class scene, not everyone on set knew the punchline that gets David into trouble. The crew cracked up, and their laughter can be heard in the movie. And yes, that is definitely awesome. But it's also a mistake, since a room full of adult men doesn't sound like a high school science class. Maybe you could tell us who first suggested the idea of reproduction without sex. Um, your wife? <laughs> Get out, lady. Get out. This video has taken me three years to finish. I'm not saying I was working on it for 40 hours a week during that time or anything, but the note that I created in Evernote, uh, which, which eventually got moved to like three different platforms over that time, it lives now in Notion, but uh, the, 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 date, the creation date on the Evernote is three years ago. In that time, I have bought a house, had a baby, and published five other YouTube videos. But this particular video took me a long time to get through, and I'll get to why 
in a minute. Uh, nevertheless, somehow I forgot to mention everything I wanted to talk about, even in the script. Uh, for example, I forgot to mention that when Matthew Broderick uh, returned Tussle's Dabney Coleman's hair, Dabney Coleman didn't know that was going to happen because the director thought it would just piss him off, so he told Matthew to do it secretly. So you can watch him in real time react. And I forgot to mention that the Air Force redesigned NORAD to look more like the movie after it came out. One of the reasons this particular project took me so long is that I used it to transition myself from editing in Adobe Premiere on a Mac to editing in DaVinci Resolve on a Linux machine. And so I, I edited the entire video on the Oryx Pro laptop behind me from System76 that's running Pop! OS, which is a, uh, which is one of their, which is their fork of Ubuntu. And what I want to do right now is actually say thank you to System76, uh, because as you can imagine, there have been some pain points with that transition, and their tech support has just been just phenomenally relentless in helping me smooth this transition. And there were a lot of quirks about DaVinci Resolve that I had to figure out. And now that I do have it all smoothed out, it's a wonderful experience. I love Pop! OS. I love my Oryx Pro. Uh, it's just fantastic. If you do have any questions about running DaVinci Resolve on Linux, feel free to reach out to me. I've been spending quite a while trying to get this nut cracked. So I can, you know, offer whatever help I can. I'm happy to do that. Also, a few months ago, I entered a contest and I won, and they flew me and a few other winners out to Denver and treated us to a, an amazing weekend and then gave us all uh, one of their brand new Thaleo desktop machines. So again, I just want to say thank you to System76 for being so awesome. The Thaleo is amazing. It is clearly a machine that is designed by and for computer geeks. To give you an idea what I mean by that, the exhaust grate on the back is designed to look like the solar system at the moment of the Unix epoch, and there is no warranty void if opened sticker. In fact, instead of that, uh, when you do open it, you will find there's a nice little row of screws inside for your tinkering pleasure. So that's the kind of machine it is. There's so much more I could say about it, but there's tons of reviews on YouTube. You can find those. Yeah, it's a fantastic machine, and they gave it to me because they're awesome. And again, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. The next video is going to get cut on that Thaleo. And of course, I couldn't have done this without help from a bunch of people, one of whom makes Mega Man style 8 bit chip tunes with occasional cello accompaniments. So if you're into that sort of thing, check out the Chips and Cellos YouTube channel, or Instagram, or SoundCloud, or Facebook, I think. It's everywhere. But anyway, it's, it's fantastic. He's really good. Thanks for watching. What's your favorite hacker movie? Let me know in the comments. To get us started, here's the complete list as I understand it. War Games, Sneakers, Hackers, Ghost in the Shell, 23 Black Hat, and War Games 2, The Dead Code. Honorable mentions include Weird Science, The Matrix, Office Space, and Die Hard 4. Please click like and hit subscribe so I can convince my wife there's a point to all of this. It's a little known fact that 70% of the movie had to be reshot with Matthew Broderick after the original star, Eric Stoltz, was fired.